Blessings, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. My special guest is Father David Nix. He is a diocesan hermit in the Archdiocese of Denver. Thank you for joining me, Father. Thanks for having me, Joseph. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Um, when um, I was thinking about doing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to title this, well, I wrote an article um, called um, Remaining in the Church That Hurts Me, and I, I was thinking about calling this podcast, um, Why Should I Stay in the Catholic Church? Um, I, I've been thinking about doing this for a while. I, I always, I kind of joke to myself, and I've actually joked with just friends of mine that I've been, well, I, I joined the Catholic Church in 1999, and I've been on my way out since then, so for the past 20 years. Um, I was thinking about a priest that I could talk about this issue with, and specifically, I want to discuss um, people, men and women, who are survivors of priest sex abuse or uh, experienced sex abuse within the Catholic Church and have left the Catholic Church, are thinking about leaving the Catholic Church, or really, really struggling, probably like I am. I'm kind of in between those last two, struggling and thinking about leaving. Um, and I thought I right away of, of you, Father, because um, I think you have um, experienced your own form of persecution um within the church and i think and and i and i've i mean i've known you for a while i've known you uh, like as an online friend but then i did get to spend with some time with you in person when you were visiting san francisco and i just felt um i'm i'm cautious and i'm suspicious around priests in general all of them but um the impression i got of you is that um i think you're sympathetic and i think you're compassionate and i think i think that and i'm just i'm just making an assumption correct me but i think that comes from your own place of being feeling betrayed by the catholic church yeah i think right? it, it is interesting that a friend of mine noticed not too long ago after certain emotional traumas that i've been through he said you're a different person and you're more quiet. You've, you've gained compassion. And, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of Henry Nowen, but apparently he wrote a book called the wounded heart where his whole point is, um, that you actually live out of the very wounds that you've received, yeah. you know, and there is a book I want to talk about later today with a single, a similar title called, um, the, uh, but it's the one by Dan, Dan Allender. It's written by a Protestant, and I can't even remember the name of it right now. I sent you a picture of it, and it's a, um, it's really about adult survivors of child sexual abuse. And when I was in campus ministry, I had so many people who had been abused as children or high school, and they weren't abused by priests, just usually, you know, your uncle or something like that. And because I've been in campus ministry in several different universities, I really find the stats are true, especially for women. It's like one in four were sexually abused as children. And I know there's conservatives and traditionalists that like to push back against that just for whatever reason, maybe to be contrary, but it's, I think it's really true. I really, I look at the numbers of what I experienced as far as people who came to me in campus ministry. And that's by far the very best book I have ever read by, by Dan Allender. And um, it's, it's like wounded heart or something like that, or, and, uh, but in that book, it has some really powerful stuff on both repentance and forgiveness and even confronting your abusers. And when I got your invite to be on today's show, I thought there's some really interesting things that could be projected onto the, the church at large for this topic that we're going to talk about today from his book that looks at repentance, forgiveness, and even confronting abusers, um, at the level of just the secular lifestyle, you know? Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I think um, I've seen enough priests who have been sidelined for doing the right thing that it really is a form of emotional abuse and spiritual abuse. 
And, um, you know, there's a lot of priests who have been lied to and lied about. And that when you look at who's called to be your spiritual brother and your spiritual father in the Catholic church, that's not just kind of a, a bad jurisdictional decision they made. I mean, it really leads to a lot of PTSD when you're lied to and lied about. And, uh, you know, I have a friend in Florida who's, um, he's married and he goes, you know, if anyone has a pass for reduced culpability, just to go get laicized after everything they've been through, it's you, <laughs> you know? And, um, uh, uh -huh. In fact, I had an auxiliary bishop once just invite me to be to leave the priesthood. No scandal, just a gentleman's request. Would you just leave the priesthood? You know, so it'd be easy for me to um, to leave and get married. And in some sense, that's certainly the temptation with with what I've been through. So I think um, I may not be the perfect priest you chose for this podcast, but I think we have something in common that uh -huh. priests have damaged us more than anybody else on the planet. Not, not you and me more than people on the planet, but the people who've hurt me most were priests and the people who have hurt you most are priests. So these were in different ways because you have physical wounds where I only have spiritual wounds, but um, I have both. You have both, of course. And the spiritual wounds, I think, hurt. But I'm going to get into that. The spiritual wounds, I think, father hurt worse. Why, why do you think that? Well, you, you, I'm, I'm, I'll, get in, I, I'll, I'll get into it in a minute because I want to quote you because you talk about that in a, in a sermon. Mm. So, so, um, but, uh, this is, kill, let me just Google that real quick. The name of that, the name of that book by Allender. So I'm not like, I know I did look, I did look it up. I did look what is it, it up. Um, I can't recall either. Wounded, yeah. Wounded heart is what it's called. Okay. Or yeah, the wounded heart. You Sorry. recommend that book father? I really recommend that book. And there's some quotes maybe a little later today that I'd like to share because it includes, um, like, honestly, Joseph, I love watching your Facebook and stuff like that. But I think sometimes we as Catholics, we tend to think that we can either forgive or confront. And this book was a really great eye opener for me to lead these young women down the road to understand that forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation to your abuser. You can forgive someone yeah. But there's no reconciliation until they own what they've done. Yeah, slightly. I, I wanted to. I wanted to. Um, I I don't want this. I don't want this. My conversation with you to be like self indulgent. Yeah. But I I know that a lot of people are struggling with this issue. So if I can kind of expose a little bit of my own frustration, maybe that they can get something out of this. Um, in, in this article I, I wrote, um, Remaining in the Church That Hurts Me, and thank you, Steve Skocek, just, just republished it. So I'll put the link here. Um, one of the Joseph, things... I, I meant, I read your blog. I meant to re read that before you sent it. I knew there was something in the back of my mind to do before we, uh, before we did this, but, but maybe that's providential so you can give a, a quick recap of it. Yeah, I, I am. I'm going to just, just like uh, read, Sorry read a that. couple of... No, 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 don't worry about it. Um, read a couple little ex and father I wanted to tell you um, first of all I mean you at least said that you would engage me on this issue I can't find priests that will do it I mean off the record mm -hmm. they will I mean it's it's not it's not difficult for a priest I think to say that they're against sure. molestation of course <laughs> You Who's know, that's not, no, fear. I mean, but I think if, if they take it a step further, I think, and talk about the church hierarchy and how ingrained this is, then they, they don't want to do it. Um, and I would have denied that word ingrained when I was in seminary 12 years ago. I don't anymore, but, but 12 years ago, I would have denied that word ingrained. So we'll talk about that because okay. you entered a traditional order and I entered a relatively conservative seminary saying, and, that's it, that's and, somewhere else. That's, yeah, that's somewhere but, else. That's, it's always somewhere else, right? Yeah, I know. So what, I mean, what's been difficult for me after experiencing um, sexual abuse by a priest when I, when I was 16 years old is that I, I've often felt that there's been a, repu a repetition of the abuse in the Catholic Church, in a, um, and what I'm talking about there 
is that I mean my I think my case is a little bit um, specific, but but I hope to get a little a little more general too, because of course, I mean eighty percent of the victims were boys, but of course girls and young women were also abused. Um, but what's been difficult for me is often hearing um, the voice of my abuser over and over again in the Catholic Church, especially recently, because um, um, when this uh, priest molested me, I mean, he'd been grooming me for a while, but specifically he got into telling me that um, I had been born gay and God mm. made me gay. Mm. And then I hear, I kind of start, I hear that again. And again, I mean, I heard it, I have to say, when I returned to the Catholic Church in 1999, um, I heard it from the first priest I spoke to, was that I had been born gay. And then I hear it over and over and over again in the church, even from um, Pope Francis, who told um, a priest sex abuse of, of survivor, um, Juan Carlos Cruz, that God had God made you like that. No wonder you hear the echo. Yeah. And then, of course, somebody like James Martin just gleefully repeats it. Yep. Was that a and Jesuit it, who molested you when you were 16? No, it was a diocesan priest. Diocesan um, priest. Hey, Joseph, can I, can I, I just jump in here on some, and say something? Go ahead. Uh, I just want to apologize to you on behalf oh, of Father every priest. No, I do. I, I want to apologize to you on behalf of every priest in the world and anyone else who's listening, who's been abused um, by a priest and tell you, I'm sorry, I've never done anything like that. But on behalf of all priests, we still are of one family of this apostolic line. And um, I don't know if it, maybe, maybe every guest you has tell you, so tells you that same thing. So I'm sorry if you've heard this a thousand times, but no. I want to apologize on behalf of every priest for that. Thank you, Father. Father. Um, one of the things that's, that's difficult to, and I just want to read you this, what I wrote in my blog. In the church, the evil and the well-intentioned continue to shame and unintentionally intimidate. Those who have been abused most oftentimes make very difficult and painful decisions that affect their physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. God doesn't want a martyr driven to self-harm or suicide. I think God will have an immense amount of mercy on them, as he did on my seemingly unrepentant libertine friends who died of AIDS, many of whom were driven to the extremes by the demons that pursued them from childhood. From Jesus Christ himself, we already know about the harsh punishment awaiting those who scandalize one of these little ones. But I think another type of chastisement awaits the faithful that smugly occupied a pew every Sunday criticized corruption of the hierarchy on Facebook and Twitter, but castigated those who are angry because they've asked for help and instead received platitudes. Since the widespread sexual victimization of children, young people, and vulnerable adults within Catholicism and the systematic cover-up is a relatively recent phenomena, the church, including the faithful, have not even begun to formulate a response to those who have been abused and want to leave saying that if you stay, you might be a saint one day, or if you leave, you might go to hell. That doesn't work. As for myself, until the voice of my abuser is finally silenced, and I feel like I'm still, I feel like I'm still in that parked car with my fingers gripped around the door handle. And that's an ugly place to spend the last half of your life. And I know, I know Catholics, lay Catholics mean well, but you know, when I've, sometimes when I've posed this question or at, or at least broached, broached the issue of sex abuse survivors who are angry with the church, want to leave the church, going to leave the church, left the church. These are the kind of, I kind of call them platitudes. I don't want to mock these people. They say things like, don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Where will you go? To whom if shall we go, Lord? Yeah, if you leave the church because you don't like what a priest says, that means you never really understood what Catholicism is about. Yeah. Okay, Father, can, can, can you help me? I think. Yeah. Lay, I know. I mean, I, maybe I, not. I, I said, <laughs> I, no, no, no. I said a lot there, yeah. and I, I think I think 
well, a lot of priests don't get it. You, you certainly do. The bishops, I don't think, get it. But I don't think a lot of lay Catholics get it, get it yeah. either. So I have, I have three, three topics, and I don't know how long you want to spend on these. Um, but ahead. they're just sort of in order of the things that you just said there. You know, when you and I were in the Castro, you and I did a video on your past and your redemption. And we sat in yep. that uh, cafe in the Castro, rainbow flags in the back. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> and we put it on census fidelium and people loved it. I mean, I was walking downtown Denver just like five months ago and uh, a young woman stopped her car and she's like, I've seen you. I was like, Oh no, what's this about? She's like, I've seen you. And I said, uh, she goes, that was amazing. You know, Joseph Chambra. I was like, Oh, oh that's- yeah. And, and, and she goes, so she's in a crowded street in downtown. People are like, you know, they're, I can't believe they're not honking because it's a moving road downtown Denver. And she just starts talking about how you have the perfect view to same-sex attracted people to bring them to Christ. And she's just saying how much she loved this interview that you and I did. But one of the things that you really opened my eye to, I mean, I was 99% in the direction of believing that one is not born gay. Of course, there's never been any proven gay gene or whatever else. But I remember when I asked you in the Castro on that video that we put up on census fidelium, I said, so is there a chance someone's born gay? And you laughed at me, like not in a disrespectful way, a way that you would laugh to a good father or a brother in Christ. And, and you went on to explain um, why it, you are really convinced this is environmental. Hmm. And you gave a really great explanation why different trauma, different things that you've grown up with can lead to the same sex attraction. And that was really eye-opening because as I said, I was 99% in the direction of understanding. Of course, there was no gay gene, but I hadn't studied it. And of course I hadn't lived it as you had. And so I can understand how it's really, really um, ravaging to your heart when you see someone in the Vatican say that you're born with this, when you hear- Not just um, someone in the Vatican, the Pope. And this echoes, as you said, the very abuser and those that you've gone to. Um, and so that's where, I, but, but so the question is, why doesn't the hierarchy who agrees with you, why don't priests and bishops who actually agree with you, who do not believe that one is born gay, why don't they say this? And the answer is the same thing that we see for everything. Lack of courage, lack of, the, of wanting to follow Christ on the cross, lack of um, Uh, an acceptance of the persecution that would come from this because in speaking the truth, we could win a thousand Joseph Chambras, but we might have to face two or three James Martins coming at us for saying that. And apparently that two or three nails in our feet from another James Martin isn't worth winning a a thousand uh, Joseph Chambras. Right. And this is where, if there's any priest listening to this as a brother, I would just encourage you to be courageous into being extremely compassionate to those who come to you with same-sex attraction, but to also to double down in what Joseph teaches that this was environmental that led to his behavior. It doesn't mean you're exempt of all responsibility for your 20 years of what you did in the Castro, but what, what led you to that was highly environmental, right? Yeah. And why I started with that, with that story about the priest who sexually abused me you know, trying to brainwash me into believing that I was gay, is that most of my frustration with the Catholic Church, that's, it comes from that place. I still have to hear the voice of my abuser over and over and over again. I'm sick of it. And I mean, you're the one who told me you went, when you finally had your conversion after, was it 10, 15, 20 years of a bad lifestyle? Yeah, about numerous numerous priests that you went to said, "Hey, just settle down with one dude." Almost right? all of them, until you finally found an SSPX priest who was a Marine, right? I, you know, it was a, it was it's complicated because I was I mean back then in ninety nine two thousand the the TLM world the traditional Latin Mass world was really fringy. I mean, mm-hmm, it, right? I mean, it's sort of fringe now, but not really. Not quite and, so much. <laughs> no, no, I mean, there, so I was, I was, I mean, I did find a good FSSP priest. Oh, okay, I, I did, thought it was first I, SSPX and later FSSP. I, 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 I don't know, they're kind of jumbled. I think you might be right, but, and mm-hmm. I found a good diocesan priest, and I did find a good SSX, SSPX priest. So I think they were all kind of within the same window of a couple of months. 
Okay. But they were all fringy. Even the diocesan priest that was helping me was really on the outs with his bishop. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Okay. And now it's a sad story, but now he's completely on the outs. But, um, and this, see, this ties into what, like, <laughs> why we're all kind of fringy, why the guys who are doing the right things get sidelined through un- impossible lies and get lied to, get lied about. And they always find some reason to get you out. Um, I have a, I'll tell you a story. I have a priest friend from a different diocese. He does the Novus Ordo. He's a conservative, but not a traditionalist. And he gave um, a, he gave like, well, he, they wanted to send him to the monkey house for psych evals. And this guy's like a cowboy. I mean, there's nothing even mildly OCD or whatever about this guy. And he told me all these things. He gave a pro-life homily. He gave a homily about how many molesting homosexuals are in the priesthood. He did this, this, and this liturgically. And I just started laughing. He was visiting me here in Denver from a different diocese. And I started laughing. I was like, you don't know which of those five you just named, why they wanted to send you to the monkey house. And he goes, no, which one? I was like, it was the one against the priesthood. <laughs> that's, that's why they wanted to send you off to the monkey house. Now, he was able to talk to his bishop and avoid this. But if you touch that button as he did, his button was why it's not actually a crisis of pedophilia, but a crisis of homosexuals in the priesthood leading to the pedophilia. He gave that from the pulpit and the, the diocesan roof came crashing in on him, you know? And so there's certain things you can say, like McCarrick's a bad guy. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> who's going to, he's the perfect scape. In fact, I heard Taylor Marshall say the other day, that's why there was no report on McCarrick is because if you just lay aside him, you don't have to go through a report. So you just made him the scapegoat and you don't have to do the report. That's the legalistic, the legalistic thing to do, but it's not the right thing to do. It's not the right thing. And that's a good segue to the second thing I wanted to say, and maybe we have a lot to say on this so far, but when there's a situation of like your abuser or whatever else, I think the general attitude in a chancery is if we expose this, it will hurt the faith of the people more than if we put it under the rug. Now, this comes from numerous chanceries who condemn McCarrick, who would, who would hear that story and say, no, we always have to bring this out. We always have to bring it out in the open. But it's interesting because if you look now in the really clear rules post-2002, post-Dallas uh, Charter, all of this stuff, it's very clear that every chancery is going to go to the law enforcement for a credible accusation. Fine. But the view towards the faithful is still... but it's better not to expose it. Now there's also been good priests who have not done anything, who someone just is mad. Some mom is mad that he gave an anti-contraception homily. So they make up, they make up false accusations. So I don't mean that we have to pull the trigger as the Dallas charter says against priests, because there's numerous priests and even some bishops who've been falsely accused. But at the very heart of the moral theology of most chanceries is this idea that the end justifies the means. And most people will admit the end doesn't justify the means for sins of commission. But do you realize the end doesn't justify the means for sins of omission too? In other words, this whole idea that we're going to save the, the lives and the faith of the faithful by putting the dirt under the rug is really going to say, guess what? You know why it never works? Because it always comes out. The dirt always comes out of the rug. Well, that's a distant second of the reason. First thing that we always want to honor God and do the right thing anyway. But at a distant second to wanting to please God, we have to realize this dirt's going to come out. And maybe tied at number two is the victims of this abuse. They deserve the truth to be known about their abuser. If it was, a tr- if it was true abuse, they deserve the truth of their abuser to be known um, because how many abuse victims are sidelined and seen as crazy and everything else? I mean, How many dioceses that have invited Father James Martin to come and speak would let you, a survivor of priest molestation, come and speak? None. Is it a zero? Zero. It's a big fat zero. I believe it. (laughs) Um, And and Father, predators and the way that they prey upon their victims change. And predators are crafty. And the, the, the type of predation that goes on the, in the Catholic Church is no different than of any other. And, and, and what I've seen is that maybe in the 70s and 80s, there was um, maybe a more preponderance of priests who were uh, molesting 
um, children and minors. Mm -hmm. But I think since that is pretty much a near impossibility maybe in the church right now, because bishops don't, I don't think bishops want to do the right thing. I just don't think they want to be legally and financially responsible. Um, but what I, the type of predation that I've seen in the Catholic Church, and I think this is why the McCarrick case was kind of symbolic, is that it's it's switched to um, um, vulnerable adults and also just priests. That's predation right. upon priests. No, I know a priest, and I have a friend, and that priest did male on male aggressive predation sexually against this friend of mine. Neither of them know that I know the other one, uh, but I know them both actually, and that priest is still in good standing. No. You so gave, I think you're, I think you're yeah. absolutely right that that's that's a, that's a bear in the room. That's an elephant in the room. No one's willing to kick out right now is adult on adult. And we've seen some bishops, not any in Colorado, but we've seen some bishops say, who was it? Cardinal Supich, didn't he at the family synod? Didn't Cardinal Supich want to basically sideline anything that had consent involved? It's like, what are you talking about? It's, there, there's, there's a power dynamic in these relationships um, that is... The, yeah, let's talk about that. Consent, I think that's, consent that's a great, doesn't. That's a great topic. Consent doesn't. I mean, it's kind of a sideline, but consent doesn't matter in a lot of these things. If we're talking about a priest and a seminarian, or a more, um, you know, a, a prestigious priest and a younger priest, or a priest and uh, a lay person, that there, that the so, the, I, the, pi the power dynamic is abusive already. So maybe you wouldn't like, maybe you wouldn't mind a little disagreement. I'm going to give you a little pushback on that. When I watched, when I was looking at the McCarrick stuff to see these 19 year old and 20 year olds who he forced to be in bed, remember how they'd run to their like lake home and there was like 11 bedrooms or no, there was, it was like 11 bedrooms for, for 12 and they all raced because whoever didn't had to, had to bunk with uncle Teddy. Right. Yeah. And it's like, so they all raced in there for one of their own beds but I'm thinking, you know, if, if I were fresh off the ambulance and right into seminary and some priest wanted to get in bed with me, I'd collapse his larynx. I don't understand this. <laughs> I don't understand this whole, I mean, I get what you're saying about the power thing, but if you don't already have an inclination to same sex attraction, why would these guys under McCarrick are, why would they buckle? Uh, why would they even join? Why would they go to a lake house where they knew this was a possibility? I they, get it. I get it. When, when, when I was um, working for this traditional order in Pennsylvania, I mean, I saw some of these young guys, most of who were, were college age, so they were like 19, 20 years old, yeah. um, who were being groomed by these priests. And it, I, I had the same thought process that you're going through too, because I, I grew up n not quite as naive or, or more savvy. But a lot yeah. of these guys came from very sheltered homes. Okay. Very trusting of priests. Right. And I, I could get where they could be manipulated. And, and predators don't prey upon everyone. Mm, they they look for pick, the weak. Yes, they will yeah. pick. And I could see that that, that was taking place there. And it's because it's certainly... I, I, I don't know how I served, Father. I don't know how I survived any of this. I, I haven't survived it psychologically, in fact, because yeah. I went to work for these priests and I was only about a year out of the gay life. And um, I, could, I could see what they were doing right away. That, that, right they away. Were, that they were picking out certain young men to prey upon. And they were the ones that had some kind of issue maybe in their family or they were at some kind of loss or they were really looking for um someone to help them and and it was a priest they were really looking for a spiritual fatherly guide i mean that's how sick it is and that's how and then the pr the predators notice that and go oh this is this is the one this is the one i could probably mm -hmm abuse mm -hmm. and so this was the pennsylvania traditional latin mass order and i remember there was like 
boys in hot tubs with priests? Did it go beyond that to full? I don't, that I'm not aware of, but I oh, do okay. remember very specifically, and this is what I had reported to the bishop at the time, that the priests were sharing a beds with, with uh, young men. And this didn't really get, I mean, I think people heard your story and thought, is Joseph exaggerating? Because we know this stuff happens in the Novus Order world, but does it really happen in the traditional Latin mass world? I don't but think then a month. year and a half ago, when the Pennsylvania report came out, they were listed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, no, there was an actual legal case. with. Oh, that, that's right. I remember you group. told me when, when and you were yeah, having but, tea in San Francisco, you told me how they even broke the seal of confession. And the group and the group and also the diocese had settled with the, the survivor. Um, but they were all, I mean, it just shows you how sick and how weird and how you can get tangled up in this stuff. Um, is that they were, they had gaslighted me the whole time because I had a priest who was my spiritual director. And at the time I didn't know that he was involved in this predation. And I was going to him and I was saying, um, I'm having trouble with this other priest. I think, I I think he's overstepping the bound Mm. of what he should be doing. And if they were minors, I would have walked, but these were, like I said, these were young adult boys, men. And I said, I think he's overstepping the bounds. And he gaslighted me the whole time and said, oh, Joe, this has to do with your past abuse. This right. has to do with everything. You're projecting, you're seeing all this stuff. This is how, this is how they work. This is how they do it. And, and that's what I mean. I mean, if, if you were to ask them about the McCarrick, everyone's easy to con- condemn that. But once you're facing it and it's going to cost you something, then it's a lot harder. And it must have been hard for you because you left 15 years of a gay lifestyle for what you finally thought was going to be a safe place of holiness, a traditional Latin mass order. You left everything. I had, I mean, I didn't have much to leave, but yeah, when I left California, just with, with, with my backpack and then I was there for yeah a while. And then. See, and I see you as an apostle. I don't, I don't see being on your podcast as um, a public pat, on your head. So just anyone listening, Joseph didn't have me on to build him up, but I'm probably going to embarrass you more by building you up and saying this than, than uh, if I excoriated you, but you couldn't be this apostle. So look like last week we had St. Peter Claver, who is the apostle to the slaves. He was the apostle to the blacks. I think he was known as the servant to the slaves. What a beautiful title. A Jesuit back when the Jesuits were good, 17th century baptized 300,000 blacks coming off of the slave ships into Cartagena, Colombia. And this guy was rough with himself. He stayed up all night with a crown of thorns on his head, literally a crown of thorns. He whipped himself all night. And in the morning for all of his hatred to his own body in the morning, when the ships would show up, he would show up and these bodies would be sliding in their own feces off of these ships, emaciated. I mean, it would have looked and smelled like a Holocaust ship. And he shows up with lemons and oranges and soap and washes them and gives them cookies, explains the gospel to them. And right there on the docks, he would have like a picture of Jesus um, and then a black person accepting baptism and not. He'd explain the basics of the gospel. Then he would baptize them and he baptized 300,000. Wow. Wow. One of the criticism against him is that he didn't follow up, but that's not true. He would walk as far as Peru and back to actually take care of the catechesis of these people. So people in different times of the church are known as the apostle to the X, Y, or Z, you know, the apostle to the slaves. I look at you, and this wasn't in my plan to mention on your podcast, you could be the apostle to the homosexuals. You could be the apostle to those with same-sex attraction. And if you hadn't gone through what you did in the Castro, what you had through numerous, numerous, numerous Nova sort of priests telling you just settle down with one guy to even the um, grooming that you saw on a traditional Latin mass order. Okay. Let's say you hadn't found that in that TLM order. You might be a lay brother. You might be praying there and prayer is certainly the most powerful thing we can do. I can tell you that as a hermit, but you don't understand how many people look to you for hope that, they too have been through numerous sufferings, numerous sins of their own. And still Joseph Sham was out there trucking away, threatening to leave the Catholic church. But you know what? At the end of the day, he stays. Um, and maybe I can too. Maybe I can too. 
That's the thing. And I, I had dinner last night with. I don't want to encourage anybody to stay in the church. I mean, that's their own decision. Sometimes I feel like a masochist, but go I ahead. Do. I want, no, I, you, you do have to stay in the church. Cause here's the thing. <laughs> I had dinner last night with two families and they're slowly going from like Nova Soto to Fraternity St. Peter. And one was a lawyer. One was uh, a paramedic. And the lawyer said something to me. I said, I said, Hey, I'm going to be on Joseph Schomburg. So you guys know him. And they both knew you, they both followed you. And, uh, and they didn't have good, they were given all the memes, you know, I, I, one guy said one thing and I was like, do you know how many old trad women put that meme on his Facebook every day? That's not going to work. You know, and I like the ones you just mentioned, don't leave Jesus for Judas, Lord, to whom shall we go? The guilt trips that you hear and, and all that. And so they didn't have great answers, but one of them texted me today, something really interesting. And I'm going to read you verbatim. He said, if he walks away from the church, he's not protecting himself. He's giving the abusers permission to continue abusing Christ's bride. Oh, talk about a guilt trip. Okay. I know. That's a, that's a, I'm Irish. I'm Irish Catholic, so I'm allowed. Let me read that again, though. I heard. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. If he walks go away ahead. abusers, permission to continue abusing. Because look, you're not here for those priests. You're here for the people who looked at you. Do you remember once you told me you had more views to your website than Jason Ebert did? At one time I did, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, people are going to repost Jason Ebert, but if you're a 19 year old in the Castro who just got done, as you call it, getting busy and 2 AM, he goes and Googles and he's reading a Joseph Schombert, he's not going to get on his Facebook and post that. No. You know, uh, now someone who's had a cool conversion might post Jason Ebert and I like Jason Ebert. He does good work, but the people who haunt your website at 2 AM, those aren't going to be the people who post that to Twitter or Instagram. You know, the people that are reading your book aren't going to be the ones um, that are, you know, working in a chancery or working for a priest somewhere. And this is where I want to read you a little bit of what Vigano said last week. He said, what would separating from the conciliar church look like in Archbishop? Oh, wait. Um, yeah, let me read you that. Okay. You asked, he wrote this to a gentleman named Mr. Cox, C-O-K-X or something. He, and he said, you asked, he's talking about this to this layman, what would separating from the conciliar church look like in Archbishop Vigano's opinion? I respond to you with another question. What does it mean to separate from the Catholic church according to the supporters of the council? He means Vatican council too. <clears throat> he says, while it is clear that no admixture is possible, that those who propose adulterated doctrines of the conciliar ideological manifesto it should be noted that the simple fact of being baptized and of being living members of the Church of Christ does not imply adherence to the conciliar team. It is true above all for the simple faithful and also for secular and regular clerics who, for various reasons, sincerely consider themselves Catholics and recognize the hierarchy. So see, he's being called a schismatic right now for recognizing what he's called a parallel church. In fact, National Catholic Register, which is conservative, we're not talking about the liberal National Catholic Reporter, the conservative National Catholic Register, written by Father de Souza, wrote an article against Vigano. And you know what it had at the end? It said, Some of his closest friends are saying he's not well. Oh, he's not doing well mentally. What does that sound like? That's gaslighting. That's gaslighting right there. And that's what happens to anybody who blows a whistle in the church on yeah. doctrine on a look. And remember, he that's was, what they said about Kanye West. They said it was Mel. Exactly. That's what they do. when they don't have an answer for you. Yeah. They've done it to me. I'm sure they've done it to you. Oh, are you kidding? They did it to me right away. What's the worst you heard? Oh, the, the, the priest that I had accused of having these improper relationships uh, with boys, uh, revealed stuff that I had told them in, in, um, in um, spiritual direction that I had, which is true, that I had a lot of mental problems. And that's, you know, and that's the thing. God uses very broken instruments to be the apostles. So I see you as the, as the apostle to those with same-sex attraction. And now you got to encourage people to stay because, like, I know you've heard all the answers. We stay for the Eucharist, not for the priests and, and stuff like that. But it really does come down to who did Christ die for? Who does he want in this? And I'll be real honest with you, Joseph, when you and I were walking through the subway of San Francisco and you were so nice to people, I almost found you flirtatious to you. You smiled at 
men? You smiled at women. I'm like, is he flirting with men? Is he flirting with women? And then I look at your Facebook and I just see like anger after priest, anger after priest, anger after priest. And I'm like trying to reconcile these two things. How is he so kind and charitable to all these people living wacky lives in San Francisco, the goths, the homosexuals, the the transgender, the BDSMers, you just, you just turn on the love light on high for them. And then I look at your Facebook and it's like all this anger. And I'm like, is this schizophrenia? And then it hit me. No, this isn't schizophrenia. It, it hit me why you're so angry at priests who give a pass to those trying to leave the life of, yeah. of uh, extreme homosexual activity versus why you're so charitable to those leaving who are leading the most radical lives of homosexual activity. And, and here's what I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong. You understand that the people who are living that lifestyle are to, to maybe quote the very title of your book, swallowed by Satan, yeah. where the priests are these portals who are, all they have to do is say the basic truths of the Catholic church, yeah. not be too hard on these people, just love them where they're at and be the portals to Christ's redemption and the great sacrament of confession to love them as brothers and sisters in Christ. But when someone like Father James Martin gives them a pass and says, you can continue in sodomy as long as you have internal forum approbation from your spiritual director and you can go to, you know, communion without confession, he essentially tells them, you have to stay swallowed in Satan's belly. Mm -hmm. And that's why I understand you're so angry at these priests who are saying to these people who are trying to escape like you did, you don't have to escape from the belly of Satan. And that is extreme religious abuse. And you have every right to be angry at the James Martins of the world because they're telling these people who are like you, who you love. And I've seen you, you'll even go to the BDSM parade. Sometimes I'm like, why are you posting this, Joseph? But I can see you're, <laughs> you have this heart of love for even the people who have the dog hoods on. And I'm like, this guy's outrageous. He's out at the BDSM parades. But what does your t-shirt say? Jesus loves gay men right? And, and the love you have, you turn this love light on 100% for them. And you understand if you send them to a typical parish in San Francisco, they got a 50-50, 90-10, you can correct me, chance of someone being like, oh, just settle down with one guy. 90-10. A 90-10. So I finally understand why you're so mad at priests and why you're so loving to those who are in the homosexual lifestyle. I have experienced a much more profound realization of evil among uh, religious priests and bishops than I have at the worst sort of shenanigans at the Folsom Street Fair. It's just the way it is. And, and, and is that more... Um, because like those verbal, people, I think a lot capacity? of times, those people are, are come, I think a lot of times come from a wounded place. And I think yeah. they just don't know any better and I think that's uh, where the world has sent them. And um, I think God will be merciful. I think a lot of priests who, who are just deceived people, I think they know exactly what they're doing. And they do it anyway. So why do you stay? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's Father. Father, sometimes I stay because, especially right now, because... I like to watch the church fall, and I'm just um, gleeful from my vantage point. In the point. hierarchy, you got to you got to delineate between those. You like to watch the, the whole hierarchy. thing, the whole thing, Father. Not the church, because that's that's Christ's bride. You can't say that. Because no, I, I mean, really, it's a, dark, it's a dark place, Father. I'm just being honest. That's, that's okay. Where I'm, that's but where theolog I'm right well, now. theologically, you sustain my correction. Then that that see, okay, Father, Father. Let me interrupt you for just a second, because yeah. that's an argument that I hear a lot and a lot of survivors hear about. Okay. You are angry at certain people in the church. You are not yeah. the church. Yeah. They are not the church. Yeah. It's very, I know that's a theological argument. It's yeah. hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around. Tell me why. Okay. Why I started with, because I, I kind of wanted to move on in a little bit. But why yeah. I started with my story is that it's been very difficult for me to, and here I am 50, and I, I still go to a shrink. And, and one of the things I talk about with him is that I go, you know, doctor, I feel, 
I feel narcissistic. I feel self-indulgent that at 50 years old, I'm still talking about something that happened to me when I was 16. Okay. And it, I mean, it, he's like, no, Joe. He said, I have people in their 80s that are dealing yeah. with stuff that happened when they were 10, you know? So he said, yeah. that that's not an issue. But I said, why I keep falling back into this re-victimization mode is because I'm still in the Catholic Church. Okay. Um, because I, the things that I see that went on with me are still taking place. And if right. anything, they are more blatant now than they mm. were then. Wow. I mean, when I was abused and I had this priest grooming me by telling me that I was born gay and God made me gay and all that stuff, you didn't yeah. really hear that stuff out loud. Mm. I mean, it was going, and I know this is anecdotally, just from friends of mine, I know it was going on behind the scenes. Yeah. But now it goes on out in public. I go, I go to, I went to the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress. I've gone for the last several years. And I go to the LGBT sessions. And this is a huge event. There's DRE, CCD teachers, religious priests, uh, parents from all over the United States and the world that go to this horror show. So um, I go to one of the LGBT sessions. It's, it's all about recognizing and confirming children in an LGBT identity. Very young children, seven seven year olds, mm. who might believe that they're LGBT, and confirming all of this. And it, they're telling um, people who who um, adults to. Um, recognize this child and a lot of time and and they give you the blueprint like oh well this could be a child that's alienated from other kids or this or that or is shy or is quiet or is having some kind of difficulty in school yada 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 they're, they're it's so sick they're yeah, but, they're telling these people to identify a vulnerable child yeah. and then to gain that child's trust and then try to discover whether if they have some sort of LGBT inclination and then confirm them in that. That's exactly what happened to me. And then when it happened to me in the 80s, the Catholic Church was not Xeroxing a blueprint on how to abuse a child and handing it out. And that's- Oh, right. Out, and it makes me sick and I'm just like, I want out. No, and I see, I, I see your attacks on, and it's not just Father James Martin, but I, I think he's the most pronounced. He didn't even, he didn't even do that. that no, but session. he's the one who's given the Xerox stuff at this point. He is on, the face. He is the face of what's been going on in the Catholic Church for a long time. Right. I mean, he's just saying it out loud. But Joseph, about, when I'm when I'm scrolling okay, through ahead. Facebook and I see that our LA Rec has started, I'm like, oh no. Except, I know you're at it. And I'm like, there's going to be a but, thorn in their side. No, hold on. I'm like, there's going to be a thorn in their side because you're not the only one who posts on the LA rec. As soon as I see it, I'm like, ah, but Joseph's going to be there as a thorn in their side. So you're kind of, the, <laughs> you're kind of this John the Baptist that shows up at that. What if we didn't have, and I don't mean, don't let this go to your head because pride will make you fall. But what if we didn't have a Joseph Chambre at the LA rec to be this thorn in their side? You play a role, man. I don't know. But I wouldn't be very happy to know that it was happening, but I'm like, I can, I can sleep. Not that it would affect my sleep. It's not the LA rec is not big of a deal in my life, but I'm like, yeah. I can keep scrolling on Facebook to see this is happening, knowing that Joseph Chambra not, and you're not just a, a thorn in their side. You're an experiential thorn in their side because you can say I was there and bad information led to this much suffering in my life. You're not a, um, a theoretical thing walking. You are, a walking crucifixion and resurrection. Let me ask you, do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Of course, yes. Okay. So you're in this whole thing to bring people to Jesus who rose from the dead. I mean, we can talk about the church later, but we agree on that, right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And, and I, re I, I realize the church is a different topic, but I believe if you believe Jesus rose from the dead, as do I, um, and you love these souls, then we're on 
the same team. We're in the same game on all this because ultimately, if Jesus with you, rise, Father, I am. Yeah, with you specifically. If, and if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, this whole thing is a lie. If he yeah. didn't rise from the dead, we shouldn't be doing this podcast. I shouldn't be a celibate priest. You could be having more fun in the Castro. It wasn't really that fun for you, I know. But I mean, it, but he rose from the dead. The, I mean, the, the reason I mentioned the LA wreck is that, you know, I know it's just a hole. But I mean, it, again, it's like James Martin. It's symbolic for what is going on in corners of the church that are less visible. I mean, right. because I, one, of the, one of the most heartbreaking stories I ever got, and I've gotten a lot, and they're usually from a mother, mm. was from a lady, um, and, not, and not in one of the cities you would think of as having a big, you know, gay community. Um, and she had a son, or has a son, that was having some issues with identity, LGBT, gay. Mm-hmm. And so like a lot of trusting catholic people you know she went to her for help she had an she had an issue with her child she went to her local parish and the parent the pastor at the parish is like oh you're in luck we have an lgbt ministry Mm. at this parish bring your son your son can go lgbt ministries at all parishes are horrible they're just they're horrible Mm -hmm. So the boy went, his mother was kind of like, okay, you know, he's being taken care of. I trust the Catholic church. I trust this pastor vis-a-vis. I trust this ministry. A few months later, the young boy emerges from this ministry, very gay, Mm -hmm. very outspoken, an LGBT activist with a boyfriend. That's what what happened. I believe it. Do you think there cannot be a good LGBT program at a parish because it doesn't treat them as humans? I mean, you and I agree on this. Well, if you had to put it in one sentence, why it doesn't work, is it, it would you just say because it categorizes them and doesn't treat them as sons and daughters of God? Right, right, right. That's how I, I see just, it. I don't, yeah, yeah, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't think they work. Especially, especially mm. I think men yeah. who are having issues with their sexual identity. I think it's just best for them not to congregate with a bunch of guys who also have that same issue. I yes. think the best thing is just for them to get involved in a parish that has a strong sort of male yep. prayer group or something. And you, you find that in the TLM and just to be around um, good, healthy, married family men. And you that, told me when we were in San Francisco, you received a lot of healing finding good straight single men and good married men just to be your friend. That's it, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's, a, great, it. that's a great piece of advice. I'm I'm not a fan of LGBT same sex attracted groups. I think they can help because yeah. specifically right now, um, if if you have a gay identity and for whatever reason you want to leave that life and you're attracted to the Catholic Church, where the hell do you go? Because there's just not a lot. I mean, every parish. Um, that's situated near a gay ghetto like uh, Chelsea or West Hollywood or mm-hmm. the Castro will have an LGBT ministry there. But right. if you want something rational, it's very difficult to find somewhere to go. I mean, courage is very underground. And that's yeah. that group was good for me. Okay. I didn't like a lot of aspects of it. But what was healthy for me mentally because a lot of times I thought I was crazy because I was like, well, I'm leaving homosexuality, but I, and I don't want to act on it anymore. Yeah. That's nuts. So at least I found other guys who were like in the same place as me. And that's yep. what was healthy. It's like, I mean, there was only a handful, but at least it was a few and it was like, okay, I'm not nuts. And I remember you, you're the one who opened my eyes to this when we were hanging out in San Francisco, you showed me that, uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of people out there, especially if they're under 40, they think of, even people who watch too much TV under 50, they think of the homosexual world as kind of will and grace. Like he's sort of the wiry, oh, funny please. guy. And you open my eyes like, no, there's, there's a whole world of the gay men out there who, who are more like the YMCA guy. Like there's a desire for masculinity. That's more accurate. 
Yeah. And I didn't realize that till you explained that to me. And that kind of explains why, like I got a really good friend. He struggled his whole life with same sex attraction and um, I never have. And we have a great friendship because I just treat him as a guy. I don't treat him as my gay friend, right? He's just a man who's brought tons of people into the Catholic church. He works for the church, but he was always smart enough, never enter seminary. And um, <laughs> because why would you go to a place where you're with a hundred people you're sexually attracted to for six years, you know? And, uh, but he's a good friend. And um, I don't treat him as a gay guy. He's just my friend in Christ. He's my brother in Christ. You know? The thing is father, when you mentioned will and grace, I got a sad story about that really, really quick as an aside, cause I'm talking too much. But a diocesan priest, it really helped me out a lot. He was sent um, for like reconditioning at one point. Uh -huh. And he called me and he said, well, you know, we've got it. We have to take a course on the LGBT, the LGBT, you know, thing. And they want us to watch Will and Grace. And we watched it in this course. And I was just like. Did he get to sent to St. Luke's or something? I don't want to say. That's the monkey house for priests. I don't want to say. But yeah. <laughs> It's, 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 and father, and I'm talking too much, but a lot, I've got, I've got so many stories and a lot of that has just built up where I've just firsthand and a lot of survivors see this too. And, and I want to, gosh, I already talked to you for an hour. Um, oh, I'm enjoying it. It feels like 20 minutes. Okay. The, uh, thank you. I, I've seen so much corruption and I, I've seen so much evil in the church. It builds up and you're just like, I feel icky. I, I don't want to be associated with this anymore. And right. I totally get where people right. walk away because it's sure. just like, and I'm going to read, I want to read you some letters that I've gotten from survivors. They'll just blow your mind because they blew my mind. Since you said corruption, can I read you something before you read those letters? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. You, you know who Josephus is, right? Sure. First century Jewish historian. Oh, awesome. And, and yeah. he's recognized by Catholics, Protestants, Jews, atheists. He was, I mean, everyone has a couple little problems, but he's known as pretty much the gold standard of first century church history and Jewish history. I want you to, this is what he wrote that the temple was like, the big Jewish temple in Jerusalem at right. 70 AD before the Romans destroyed it. 70 AD. 70 AD. So this is 40 years after the death of Jesus and like a couple months before the Roman Empire destroyed the temple. This is, I'm going to read you verbatim. It's maybe a hundred words. So all your listeners hang, hang tight for one sec. Listen to this. This is Josephus, quote, for he permitted them to do all things that any of them desired to do. He's talking about the high priest. While their inclination to plunder was insatiable, as was their zeal. Now he's talking about all the, the temple priests. Yeah. As was their zeal in searching the houses of the rich and for murdering and for the murdering of the men and abusing of the women. It was sport to them. They, the temple priests, also devoured what spoils they had taken together with their blood and indulged themselves in feminine wantonness without any disturbance till they were satiated therewith while they decked their hair and put on women's garments and were besmeared over with ointments and that they might appear very comely. They had paints under their eyes and imitated not only the ornaments, but also the lusts of women and were guilty of such intolerable uncleanness that they invented unlawful, that they invented unlawful pleasures of that sort. And thus did they roll themselves up and down the city as in a brothel house and defiled it entirely with their impure actions Nay, while their faces looked like the faces of women, they killed with their right hands. And when their gait, G-A-I-T, when their gait was effeminate, they, present, they presently attacked men and became warriors and drew their swords from under their finely dyed cloaks and ran everybody through whom they alighted upon, close quote. Wow. So what he's saying right there is the temple priests were murderous, transgender, and doing everything possible. I think it just said in the temple. Sounds, sounds very, very familiar. And, and like, uh, oh, and that one quick thing to follow up on that with, I was talking to Taylor Marshall about arguments that we have for set of a contest, why to stay. And he gave this, you know, and this is obviously before that. Um, but remember the second, the second temple was built by Herod, who is Edomite. And, and Taylor and I've been talking, I know, you know, Taylor, you've been on his show. Um, I haven't. Yeah, you have. No. Nope. Oh, no. well, he, he talks very well of you. So here's four things that he sent me on text, and he gave me permission to mention his name okay. on your show. So four, four points. One, St. Joachim worshipped the temple and received the prophecy of Our Lady's conception at the, Jeru at the Jerusalem temple. Two, 
St. Zachary, father of John the Baptist, served the temple and the angel Gabriel appeared to him there concerning the conception of St. John the Baptist III. Our Lady lived at the temple from age four till 14 with Anna and the Holy Virgins and widows at the Jerusalem temple. And four, St. Simeon was a priest and received Christ at the temple in purification. This is the same temple that within 70 years and, and assumedly then, because see, John the Baptist was actually a priest. Remember, he's from a priestly line. He had nothing, he wanted nothing to do with it. Right. He He's still a Jew out in the wilderness, executing his Adamic, that's the adjective for Adam, executing his Adamic priesthood out there. But look at this. The temple priests are violent transsexuals doing various gross things in the temple. And yet, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph never extricated themselves from this corruption. They still kept going to that temple. And then they went to Nazareth. Which well, was a back, they, they, which they was a back, back water. Yeah, well, they had to go yeah. back and forth. Yeah, because Nazareth was a backwater, but they still, when Jesus was 12, had to take that pilgrimage to yeah. the temple. So they didn't say, you know what, we're going to go to the Essenes where they're living a cleaner life. The Essenes were Jewish too. They were like, we're, we're still going to go there. Do you think, you think Joseph, the leader of that family, probably kept his ear to the rail and knew how corrupt that place? I mean, everybody of knew. Course. Herod wasn't even a Jew. He was a half-breed who was an Edomite and had... Uh, you know, he basically built it for his own glory. And this is my argument against set of a contest. Like, yeah, the modern, the modernist hierarchy is one of the most corrupt institutions I've ever seen. But I still go there. Just as Jesus, Mary, and Joseph went to this temple built by a dude who wasn't even a Jew, who within 50 years and possibly then had transvo transvestite violent men serving there but the Holy Family still went there because it was Judaism. You and I still go to Mass because it's still Catholicism. We don't like the fact there's this much corruption, but we still go. You see the analogy there? You don't have to buy it yet. You don't have to tell me you buy it, but do you see the analogy? Oh, I get it. I get it. I understand it like theoretically, but practically it's, yeah, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated because you're dealing with a lot of um, not just emotion, but um, just a lot there. I, I wanted to, and I've talked too much, yeah. Father. I, I no, I'd to love talk, to hear these letters that you had. No, no, but first I want to talk about a sermon you gave, and this was on 8 26, 2018, and you called it Sermon on the Scandals. Do you recall that one? Not at all. Okay, well, then I'll remind you. You, <laughs> you, wrote, you wrote, I talk, I talk so much, I forget the things I say too. So it was a good one. You wrote, child abuse leads to psychological death, and heresy leads to spiritual death. One of the things that a lot of people who are survivors of sex abuse, I mean, they've definitely, I mean, they've definitely experienced the, 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 the physical abuse and the psychological abuse, but they've also just dealt with, um, the hierarchy of the church that that won't deal with it makes excuses and covers it up to this day and that and that's like a heresy it's like a heresy and it and it causes a spiritual death this that's is right. where i was talking about i can understand what you're talking about theoretically but not practically yeah. it's just some a lot of people and i know i'm included is it when you've had these difficulties with the church I mean, you definitely sense yourself losing faith in the institution of sure. the church, but then sure. you start sensing that you're losing faith in God. And, yeah. that, and that's at the point when you, I'll just say for me, I'm not going to speak for anybody else. That's yeah. at the point when you panic and you yeah. say, I, I got to do something and I got to leave because if I stay, I'm going to lose everything. I get it. And now I remember when I gave that sermon, that was the weekend. it was right it was right during the Vigano thing because exactly. I want to ask you it was about that. I was in Kentucky. It was twenty four hours after Vigano blew the whistle yep. on McCarrick, and see already the mainstream Catholic media is covering over it as if McCarrick was a problem. But remember, he blew the whistle on how many people knew about McCarrick. That was the real scandal and covered over it, right? Father, you were very your tone was very hopeful in that sermon. And I, and I can take myself back at that point in time, too. And I, and I don't want to sound 
like uh, like I'm a perverted person. But when I when I first started hearing about Archbishop Vigano, and my heart went out to all the survivors and the victims, but I was also hopeful too. And you talked about that because I thought finally things are going to change. Things I do too. things are being revealed. All of these things that I've known about, and I, I had no contact with McCarrick, I don't know him from Adam, but all of the, thing, the things that were going on, and that, that case, I think even for women who have been abused, and he, he only abused men and boys, that case was so symbolic because it sort of encapsulated what all of us had to go through, was like um, being abused by someone in a position of power and then having no one that will help you. Right. But I still, here's why I still see that hope is, uh, again, I was going to ask you, are you still, because I'm not, I would say I, I feel more, more pessimistic than ever because yeah. I thought, and this is how naive I talked to my friends. I was like, Oh, all these bishops are going to have to redesign Kupich, Tobin, all Gregory. They're all going to resign. Pope Francis is going to have to resign. This is so scandalous that they're just going to have zero. Oh, I know. But you're looking in the wrong place for the hope. I mean, okay. again, for your listeners, Joseph didn't have me on a two to zone. But the only, you know, I, I float back and forth between the Novus Ordo world and the Latin mass world. I know set of Acontis, I'm friends with SSPX priests. I, um, my, my extended family is all liberal Catholics in Chicago who loves Bernadine. Well, side what? Line. Yeah, I know. And so you have to understand where I come. I wasn't hatched in a little traditionalist circle, right? So, but, but everywhere I go, maybe not the liberal circles, but I'll tell you every, all of the neoconservative Novus Ordo circles, as well as the trad circles, the only two people, and you know, we Catholics, we live in a circular firing line. We're all shooting each other. All the trads are always angry at each other. The only two people that seem to be liked by 99% of the people in the Novus Ordo conservative world and the full trad world is you and Father Ripperger. Mm-hmm. You're the only two people that I, that people don't have some type I, of vendetta against, you know? know that. And that's where I see, that's where I see hope. You know, another, another great bridge between the neoconservative Novus Ordo world and the traditional Latin mass world is, so you know this weekend out there in California, Governor Newsom that just legalized pedophilia down to the age of 14. Very well. Well, it's complicated, yeah. But yeah. Okay, something yeah. like that. Yep. So my friend Grace just opened Children of the Immaculate Heart. It's going to be a Catholic home for girls who've been sex slave trafficked. They're moving in girls 12 to 14 years old. These girls have been raped thousands of times. And oh, my friend Lord. Grace, she lives, she lives uh, right next to a fraternity of St. Peter Parish in a little Latin ghetto uh, in this little place. And the home she has raised enough money for 5, 10, 15 girls is this enormous mansion. I won't say for the sake of safety of these girls what town it's in in California. It's not San Diego. This huge mansion for these 10, 15 girls who've been trafficked. Um, I used to be vice president of it like five, 10 years ago. So, and I'm, I'm not any part of it anymore, but I'm still associated with them. They're my friends who run it, you know? And I was brought to tears on Friday when I found out this was opening because a year ago, the state of California said, you have to allow transgender surgeries and contraception for these girls. Grace is this little 90 pound woman who has cystic fibrosis, takes her food by a G tube. And oh, no. she's just surrounded by the right people Catholic Answers supports her. Fraternity St. Peter supports her. She sues the state of California and wins and now opens a full home for girls who have been sex slave trafficked there in California. So I, you know, I see this, this good news um, happening. I do want to speak briefly to when you mentioned, you know, when you lose faith in the institution, it starts to attack your belief in God. And there's a really interesting quote from Allender. This is a Protestant. You don't hear a traditional Latin mass guy quote Protestants a lot. <laughs> but he has he has a few pieces of medicine on how to um, not lose your faith. And one, of the, I want to get to the prescriptions, but one of the diagnoses he gives, it's very similar to what you just said, is this. He says, quote, the deepest harm of mistrust is perpetuated against God. God is seen as a games player, a cosmic sadist who twists the screws of pleasure to entice and oh. pain to frustrate his victims. So he's, and he's talked to thousands of adult survivors of child sexual abuse, and he saw that that's where they can kind of turn against God, not really in a state of malice, but in a state of confusion. And maybe if we have time towards the end of your show here, I can give you some of the solutions that he has to this. But I hear a little bit of what you're saying in that of like, wait a minute, the institution hurt me. They're a representative of God. 
why is the wheels on the back of my bus shaky against God right now? I get it. You know? Yeah. I, I think that if I saw some kind of movement towards taking responsibility and making restitution after um, the Vagana revelations, I don't think I would be in the place I'm in right now, but I didn't. Right. I, actually, I, right. I, what I saw was more digging in the heels and more denial. Totally. I mean, you know, I have a deaf niece, right? No, I, I didn't that. tell you that. And when I saw that Archbishop Bergoglio of Buenos Aires knew and covered over the oh, molestation. that was awful. Remember this? Five yes. Years ago. Horrible. So, but, but 10, 15, 20 years ago, the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Bergoglio, knew yep. that deaf, school. Deaf, ch deaf children were being abused by priests because they couldn't talk to anybody, right? That's when my, I mean, obviously I hate all this stuff, but that broke my heart in a new way, having a deaf niece, yeah. um, seeing, seeing that. And do you think he's answered for that? No, no. So he hasn't gone, he's never gone back to Argentina. Well, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Well, let me, let me read you real quick this other quote from- I don't Aaron. want to get into him because he's- No, no, this, yeah, we won't talk about- No, 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 but I just, I, ugh, I just, yeah. I don't like Pope Francis. I don't. I don't like him. I think he's either the an anti-pope or I just, I, when he, you know, I was always willing to give him sort of the benefit of the doubt. But when he told a sex abuse survivor that he was made that way by God, I said, done, done. Don't want to hear anything this man has to say anymore. Done, done. Well, I'm, bar he's, I'm barely he's, in good standing. He's, so I'm not he's covering up. No, I know. I'm not asking you. But I, 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 I just was done no point. it's that's and, and that's um it was so sick you know and and there was rumors that that he didn't approve of father james martin and i put on facebook before the truth came out there's no way these are two peas in a pod let's let's stop this charade that father james martin's going to get corrected by him no he loves his work every time i take a deep dive one of these gay catholic rat holes i always <laughs> find it always there's always a jesuit connected somehow yeah sick sick order so never a, never let your child near the jesuits i had i had uh i went to jesuit high school actually um listen to this line from allender on vengeance and god's justice though this is interesting because i think we catholics you've probably heard this well just forgive and forget joseph that's how you move on but I think Allender has a deeper sense of forgiveness, but he also understands this doesn't have to be detached from a sense of God's vengeance. Listen to this quote. Second quote, second, revenge gets in the way of God. Our oh, acts yeah. of revenge are puny. His is perfect. This is from a super compassionate Protestant. This isn't like a five point Calvinist. This is like an evangelical. Second, revenge gets in the way of God. Our acts of revenge are puny. His are perfect. Paul does not condemn the Romans for wanting revenge, only for seeking it. Most Christians are uncomfortable with the righteous rage of God. God is angry. We are too. But we've been invited to wait for the day, which is soon to come, when we can crush the neck of Satan with our feet. The desire for revenge is honoring to God. Getting in the way of his per patient call to repentance and his righteous judgment is foolish. So, I mean, I'll tell you this. If you look at the old school saints, the fact there isn't a coming of day, there isn't a, a, a coming to light of the hierarchy that you've mentioned, it's actually a prediction. It's, it's according to saints, this isn't me. This is signs of their predestination to hell. Because if they had been called out on earth, that would be a sign of their repentance. So you shouldn't be so worried about the fact that there's so much advance for these people doing it. It's actually a sign that they're going to go to hell and they're going to endure a lot worse in hell than any correction online from you. But, but in the meantime, they're happen. but in the meantime they're putting me through hell. Yep. I know. And and I'm, Father, I'm not, I, no. I'm not going to say no. They're not. I know. Yeah. And Father, people write to me. I'm concerned about you. I, I don't like what I've become either that I've become angry and bitter and vengeful. I don't like it either. And that's why I, I, I want to leave the church because I don't like what I've become either. Sure. W would you be better outside? I don't think so. I mean, and I know you hear this. You know what? It would be, I, and, I've, and I've talked about, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I've talked no, it's about okay. this. I've talked about this with a non-Catholic priest. Yeah. And I think part of it, and I know, I, you know, because I want to go to orthodoxy. 
Right. And I know they have their own issues and I don't agree with a lot of things they teach, yeah. but it's kind of like a psychological thing. It's kind of like, I'm done. It's kind of like when yeah. a woman leaves her abusive husband, it's like done. It's kind of like, I'm saying I'm done. Goodbye. Yeah. You're out of my life. But those it's, theological things aren't anything to poo poo. I mean, I don't know if you're talking about fully or whatever, but I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't realize your pain until about 45 minutes ago when you said that you keep hearing the echo of that 16 year old or when you were 16 year old, 16 years old and what you heard that priest say, I, I kind of had yeah, another sliver that, yeah. of the level of that, of that pain, but you can't downplay the fact through and through and through and through you are a Catholic and you know, you know, your theology leaving the church um, because you wouldn't have that Pavlovian response to certain voices still couldn't placate the fact you're a Roman through and through. I love, look, my, my sister's raising her family Byzantine or her husband and her are, I love the, the Eastern churches, but um, you're, she's a Catholic through and through. I'm a Catholic through and through. You're a Catholic and through and through. Don't relinquish the church to these bums. Yeah. That kind of goes back to the argument that some people give me is like, stay in the church and be a martyr and that's you can't ask somebody to do that but what about what about what you I read can't these, you, these you can i mean the transvestite temple people jesus mary and joseph still went doesn't see i think you folk if you can let me you can cut this out if you don't like me challenging on this but i think you focus too much on them when all these people look to you all over the globe for for the fact you've escaped that lifestyle and you hammer away at the 1% of the church that doesn't accept you when like 80% of the church does. Yeah, that, that 20% who runs the chancery, who runs the parishes, who never invites Joseph Schomburg to talk. Um, until we see the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, you're not going to get any invites to parishes. I'll tell you that right now. Well, but Father, I, Father, I don't, so I don't, people. Yeah, Father, I don't care about that. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of done with that, but right. it's, it's the, it's the constant, um, it's constantly, I don't know how else to say it. Why don't it's, you tell me it's your constantly, story? It's constantly having to hear yeah. the voice of my abuser. Yeah. And priests, bishops, cardinals, and the Pope. How about the and very that's first the question? And that's the voice I hear. How about the very first question you asked me? Did your abuse cause you to be a more compassionate person. Like, why don't you tell me a letter you've received from someone who has decided to become Catholic, leave the gay lifestyle and stay in the church because of you. Can you, can you tell me off the top of your head, someone like that? Probably. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, but probably tell me one. I put most of the time I actually receive, you know, messages or correspondence from people who are already in the church yeah. and they have struggled as let's say somebody with same sex attraction but who wants to follow the catechism and the teachings of the church and are finding it very difficult to do because they don't get support in the church yeah so because i i've talked about that they at least feel um that there's somebody else and and i know you and i you and i talked offline before we started just how superficial and parochial it can be for someone just to say well joseph just offered up so i don't want to repeat what a thousand old trad women have said you just offered up but <laughs> but there has to be some connection between you still hearing what you heard as a 60 year old abused by a priest versus all these people that have come to know christ in the church through you one feeds the other i, I mean i think you wish this was gone so you could keep reaching people but this is like there's like a, uh, a magnetism between these two that allows you to reach these people because of that continued pain. And I know you've heard that from a thousand people, but I think maybe you have to start lining them up specifically that 16 year old echo or when you were 16, what that priest said to a specific letter that you get from someone who's left that lifestyle. You got to realize that even though Christ paid the full price on the cross, we also have a price to pay for souls and you're paying it for certain people right now. And that's tied to your catechesis. It's not like you get the free pass of the catechesis 
without something off. And I'm not saying God willed that. Obviously, that was only in his permissive will what happened to you in 16. I'm not saying God had that happen so that you have fuel in your evangelical engine for that, right? Of course, I wouldn't be that morbid. But God allowed it. It's horrible for you now. It's probably going to be horrible for you to the moment of your death. And it's feeding your evangelization of these people that stay in the church because of you. Yeah. What's been more difficult, because I think uh, mostly because I think the psychiatric care I've had, that yeah. original wound that I experienced at 16, I could say has been healed. What has compounded it is it because I hear the voice of my abuser, I know the end point of what they're saying. When they're telling a young person yeah. that God made you gay, I know the possible endpoint, the ramifications of what they are doing. And that's why I have a difficult time staying in the church because I feel like I'm complicit. And luckily there's a lot of other voices like you out there. So, oh no, there no, aren't, there aren't actually, father. There's not, I was being sarcastic. <laughs> but I feel, got I, you. I got you. That's why you have to stay. I feel like I'm being, I feel like I'm complicit. I feel like I'm complicit. And how can you not? Because I'm, I'm, I'm claiming allegiance to this, to this institution. This okay, was your hero, was your hero Saint Joseph? Was your hero Saint Joseph complicit in going to a temple run by violent transsexuals? Well, well, I, I love Saint Joseph. No, no, no. No, he wasn't complicit. He turned an eye, wouldn't let his family see it, did what a good Jew does, and had nothing to do with it. Because you know what? He was in the business of raising a family and helping the Savior of the world save the world. And that's what, that's what you and I are in this business for. I didn't become a priest for other priests. You know, you know, funny story. I almost got kicked out. Uh, almost every month I got kicked out of seminary. But we had to like do some evaluation of our life and past. It said, which, which priests are your heroes? And I wrote in there, I really don't have any priest heroes. All my heroes are Catholic laymen. Oh, and cool. They started uh, bringing me, I mean, I just started getting railed for that. And they basically gave me numerous chances to take that back and stay in seminary. And sometimes I capitulated in that stuff. That time I didn't. I just said, no, I really, I really don't know priests as much as laymen that I like. And what are they going to for some reason, they didn't kick me out. They threatened numerous times. Every month I got threatened with being kicked out of seminary. But uh, I remember that. That was one of the times they put pressure on me and I never, I never capitulated. I said most of my heroes were Catholic laymen. And you know why I stayed? It's because I'm in this for souls. I wasn't in it for any of these priests. And that's why very few priests like me, because um, I'm not in it for them. I'm kind of lonely. I mean, I'm not going to pretend like my life's perfect. But um, I'm in this to get families to heaven not to be in a priest club and I will never be invited to a priest club and that's okay. You're better it's, off. It's hard. It's lonely, but it's worth it. <sighs> okay. Father, this is kind of, well, this has all been kind of heavy lifting. Um, if you don't mind, I want to read you a couple of letters that I received. This is going to, this is going to be kind of tough for me to read, but um let's take them one by one maybe that would be better um, I, I and I've, I've gotten a lot but i chose these because i thought they were very indicative of a lot of the pain that people are experiencing and i just thought they were beautifully written heartfelt and crazy good okay. uh, here's the first one Okay, uh, the church has, no, and um, I did get permission from the writers of all of these letters to read I always them. do that too. I won't, I will never share stuff without permission. That's yeah, great. and although I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell who they are or even the, their gender. Great, I'm pumped to listen. Uh, yeah, this person wrote, the church has not moved toward a response to individuals like us. To the charismatic corner of the church, our pain is self-inflicted because we allegedly don't choose joy and forgiveness. To other corners, we are ungrateful for the Eucharist or for the struggle, which will surely make us saints. To both of those, I can confidently say, F you, F off. Pain is the only human indicator that something is wrong. The most basic apology will never present itself in my life, as I'm sure it's unlikely to in his. 
even that would not right the colossal wrong that exists in the body and the soul of those who abused in the church. Pain will persist most likely until we die. God does not wish that on anyone. Nonetheless, it exists because of terrible people and the dumpster fire that we call the body of Christ. The things we do to each other have permanent effects. We are walking reminders of that reality. And I, I get what they talked about in terms of people saying, well, you're choosing to be hung up on something that happened long ago. Yes. Or, you, or you're ungrateful because look at what the church has bestowed upon you. Yeah, we've had a lot of superficial answers for extremely deep wounds like that. And Father, I don't, I mean, this, I think me and you may be the beginning of something. I don't see anyone even starting to formulate a response to people like this, other okay. than don't leave, don't leave Jesus for Judas. That's the yeah. only response I've seen. Okay. We've, we've heard that line a lot. What do you say to somebody like this? Not you specifically, yeah. but I mean, I deal with these people too. And this is me. That's why they wrote you. I mean, that's why they wrote you. And I, but that line is important. Like, um, of that whole thing, the line that rings in my ears the most is pain is this indicator that something's wrong. Um, you know, there's actually a physical disease where people can be born without pain receptors and they yeah. all die by the time they're about 12 years old because they break a bone or something and can't feel it and they bleed out. Um, so, you know, does that spiritually exist for a similar reason to keep us from spiritual death? Yeah. And see, I can't respond to these people and say, don't leave the church because I can't tell them to do something that I'm not thinking about myself. I, I, I can't, I can't say it in my you own know, conscience, Car Car in my Car own Car conscience. Cardinal Newman though said a thousand difficulties doesn't equal one doubt. And you know, um, you, I don't, I don't mean to, put this in your face as like something insincere so that you finally pull the trigger, but you've been threatening that for a while. And, and you for 20 years, father. Yeah. But you staying doesn't make you weak in my eyes. I mean, I see you as being very hurt by priests and, um, and that's why they write you that stuff. And so maybe here's the thing you can respond to people like, see, I can, I can respond and say maybe a little more superficial answers. <laughs> don't leave Jesus for Judas. I mean, all that type of stuff, but <laughs> I don't, I wouldn't be that superficial, but I might go a little bit deeper, but you could, you could say, and I wouldn't say this because I would find this somewhat um, against my own beliefs, but in sincerity, you could say, I'm thinking of leaving and here's why I don't. So you don't have to just give kind of a super pious, superficial answer of here's why you shouldn't leave. You can give an experiential answer to say, I hear you, my pain is similar. I'm thinking of leaving. I'm hanging on by the thinnest thread. Yep. And let me tell you about this tiny thread that's holding me because that tiny thread that holds you might be different from just the person putting the meme up that says, Oh, who, to whom shall we go? Lord, who, to whom else besides the Catholic? That I person, hate that. I hate that response. I they probably heard it. it. Yeah. And whoever wrote that's probably heard it. That's why they're writing you because they don't need to see a meme that just says to whom shall we go? Lord, they're writing you because you are going to give a more honest answer. Yeah. Father, something I wrote too is that I, I, I think you kind of revealed something to me just now is that I think a lot of times I do say that I want to leave the church because I want somebody to tell me not to leave. And I would say, over I hope the, I've, I hope I've been clear in that in this podcast, calling you the apostle to those with same sex attraction. You can't leave. We need you. So, so over the 20 years, I think what's kept me in, because I mean, that first day I walked back into a Catholic church and this priest told me that I was still gay. The very and first I, day? Oh yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. It was in San, I was in San Francisco and you know, I go, I'm going to go to, and I wrote about this ad nauseum. I'm going to go to the local parish. They have the rain, rainbow flag outside. Oh, they kind of understand me. They kind of know where I'm coming right, from. Right, right. And then he gave me this whole spiel. He he wanted to like uh, uh, turn me out. He was like saying, "Oh, I got somebody I want you to meet." because he, no he had a little group. He had a little group. First day, he was trying to hook you up with somebody. Uh, he was. 
So, I mean, I, I was ready to bail on that day. But what has kept me in the church over the 20 years, and this is why I, I sometimes feel so guilty about saying things about the priest or priest, is that the, the, the ones that have kept me in have been good priests. I mean, you played yeah. a part in this too. No, thanks. But it's, it's usually like one good priest after another, like an SSPX priest. An FSSP priest. And you were, and you, I don't, I don't want to go priest. into what happened nine months ago, but you were there for me in a real tough time in my life too. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. But you know, a diocesan priest that, dumped, that got dumped on by his bishop or a father of mercy. There's always been yeah. like good priests that like I met at the time I needed a, and I stayed yeah. longer, right? like a year. Right. Recently, it's been, I'd say, Father Altman. He's kind of kept me in for a little longer. And then and we I should know. turn this into a two part series so we can talk about Father Altman because he gave me courage. And we're getting I can keep talking, but people may not want to hear me talk. Uh, so maybe you should make this a two part. You can cut this out. But I want to talk about Father Altman. And maybe, you know, Joseph, maybe it's like man. Remember man in the desert? They they never God never gave more bread than you could actually like stuff into your your whatever yeah. they wore back then, their clothes. Okay. He only gave you enough bread for that day. Um, never less, never more. Maybe that's how our spiritual life goes. That you only get one it's priest at one step along the line to just it's awful. Barely. <laughs> and it's and I have to say it's been Bishop Strickland lately too, mm. and Archbishop Vigano, and I and I kind yeah, of pondered the right. other. There, there's some there's some real courage there. I think. I mean, they I, they yeah. take some hits. I pondered the other day out loud. What happens when I don't have these people anymore? What happens when the manna doesn't come tomorrow? Yeah, it comes. It always comes. God's good. Look, you believe Jesus rose from the dead. Everything comes from that. You can muscle through it. Stay okay. in the church. Oh, you want to hear it directly? Don't leave the church, Joseph Chambra. Okay. I will fly out to San Francisco <laughs> and kick your butt. That would be awful. Let, let, can I read you another letter, Father? These are short. Yeah. Okay. 99% um, of the time, I feel crushingly alone, desperate to leave for some type of reprieve and cornered into staying by the statement that the Eucharist can be found nowhere else. What shall I do then besides waste away and die of grief in this place? I'm so unbelievably sorry that you feel similarly, but I feel less alone knowing that someone else out there understands what I'm going through. <clears throat> That's, it's not because I blame God and that I don't think enough positive thoughts, don't choose joy, etc. It's because my entire being has been violated to the core in the house of God, continuously li reliving it as long as I remain. I'm just trying to survive, and I hope God has mercy on me. Hell, what do you, wow. That, that right there is someone who stayed because of you. Oh, I don't know that. But. They said that. They, that was right in there. Because look, I couldn't answer a letter. See, I haven't been through that. I couldn't answer that letter with anything but pious platitudes. That's why they wrote you. Oh, Father, you haven't been doing that so far. So No, I haven't. But, Don't sell but, yourself short. But I still couldn't. I mean, but did you hear that? There was a line in the middle of that that they're staying because they see you carrying a similar cross. It's not because we have all the right answers. It's because they see you carrying a cross. I mean, the old adage is so true. Actions speak louder than words. So you and I may not have something to say to something that heart wrenching, right? I don't. But the fact that you and I stay after so many priests have thrown us under the bus shows that we we're not just giving pious platitudes that we stay because of the Eucharist. We actually are staying for something bigger than the priesthood. Father, I mean, what sticks in my throat is that because I I and it was it was when you were reading that stuff about Josephus. And I was like, well, the temple was destroyed after that. And I was <laughs> thinking, I was thinking in my mind, I wouldn't particularly mind if the whole edifice of the Catholic Church, including the Vatican, were just destroyed. And then there were good priests like you, but that's the life I've been living anyway, just still exist in the hinterland, still doing what they have to do. But at least I don't have to pretend that. I recognize or respect this thing as the Catholic Church. I mean, that's, this is where a lot of people would say I'm nuts because you have to respect the papacy. You have to respect the man. You have to respect all these things. I don't. I don't. I respect you individually. I respect uh, Bishop Strickland. 
I respect certain priests in the, this thing, the yeah. anti-church, whatever Vigano called it, I don't respect. And I don't, I don't care if it crumbles. Well, that's, that's why it's an interesting term that, that, but I'm not Catholic. That, yeah, you are. Yes, you are. If Catholic. I believe that. No, but here's the thing is, listen to this. I, I took a retreat at a traditional seminary on the East coast uh, last week and they read something to us from sister Lucy that I had never heard. And, um, you know, sister Lucy's the one who saw our lady of Fatima. Let me see if I can zoom in on this here. I'm going to have to get close to the camera. So sorry for your listeners to see my face close, but this is from sister Lucy. She wrote this in 1958 to a priest and we were at a silent retreat. A seminarian read this from up on this high thingy and I had never heard this words. I'm going to write a whole blog post on, on this called the lost letters of Lucy. She writes this, however, Father, people must be told that they cannot, this is 1958, before things got super bad. And this is Sister Lucy assumedly getting this from Our Lady of Fatima. However, Father, people must be told that they cannot expect any call to prayer and penance from the sovereign pontiff, nor from the bishops, nor from their parish priests, nor from the superiors of religious orders. No, our Lord has already used those means, but they were ignored. That is why now it is necessary for each one of us to begin on his own, the spiritual reform of self. Joseph, I don't know if you realize what we... Go ahead. We just read your own. You're on your own, is what she just said. She said you're on your own. Yeah, you're not going to... You're not... What Sister Lucy said, she said from 1958 onwards, you're not going to get the spiritual reform of self-support that you need from the hierarchy. So at least we, I mean, I'm not saying that's great news, but at least we can't be mad at heaven since heaven has already warned us we're on our own, right? What is it with so many Catholics who get absolutely frothy? I mean, if, if the Pope says something marginally Catholic. <laughs> I know. Don't you I mean, know the guy, <laughs> the, the priest who abused me was not, was not, uh, uh, somebody maybe that you would recognize as a monster. Oh, McCarrick, I mean, yeah, McCarrick went to pro-life dinners. Does, does any bishop who goes to a pro-life dinner automatically get our pass as orthodox because he went to a pro-life dinner? McCarrick did. But, but the Pope has still covered up and said what he said. And I can't overlook that. Maybe I people like that don't They get frothy at the mic. Yeah, like... One orthodox thing we hear a year, people repeat like that is somehow exoneration. It's crazy. I agree with you. I agree a hundred percent with you. This is crazy. It is. It, and it's not, it's, I think it makes, I think it, I know it does to me. And I think it makes other survivors think, you know, look, these lay people really don't have our back because even these men in the hierarchy who have, have, have perpetuated this sick, this sick uh, culture of cover up, if they if they throw them a crumb, they're excited. No, no, we can't. And you know, I'm the first Get to forgotten. preach. Against, I'm I'm the first to preach against all of this reduced culpability. You know, the left loves to use re reduced culpability for everything on moral issues. But having said that, I always sideline that as not a very good moral theology. I will say this: I could see how someone like James Grind, who was abused, who apparently is working hard to make it back to the sacraments. Why God's going to be so patient with someone like him. I right? love him. Yeah, he's a great, I got to speak with him, you know, remotely, but wonderful. I can't believe, because what I experienced compared to him is like this, is like this. And I can't believe that he's still able to come from a place of like joy and peace. And you it's hear that in the letter. It's yeah, you hear that in the letter that you just read is some... Some people are just hanging on by a thread right now. And that's where they look to you. They look to Father James Altman. People are given hope by Archbishop Vigano. People are given hope by Bishop Strickland. I mean, people look to you guys with that last thread. And do we wish it was a full hardcore cable they were hanging on? Of course we do. But if it's lame little threads like you and me, people are hanging on by, hey, take what you can get right now. I've, you kept ever, you too, I've kept you too long. I want to read one last letter, Father. Yeah. Maybe. We got to talk about Father Altman because he's pretty, he's pretty strong. I love him. Yeah. Um, this is kind of long, but 
and Can I break this into two two podcasts. This is good. I'm, well, I know this letter's kind of long. I'm a, I'm going to read it. Um, this is a person I really love and admire. Well, I was being a good martyr and continuing to fight for the church despite my abuse. Fellow Catholics were there to wave their faith flags proudly. The moment I needed to step away to preserve my life, those same adoring supporters turned into pious abusers. No clergy abuse victim chooses to be a victim, a martyr, a survivor. Each one of us has had to struggle with our justifiable loss of the church. We've been chastised and told we're leaving Jesus to suffer alone. We're wearing the label of victim by choice. We're going to hell. I haven't a doubt in my soul that our God is not only as merciful as we know he is, especially towards those of us who've already died for the church, but he will also hold responsible those who have continued to stone us for daring to speak about our pain and all the spiritual turmoil. Catholics, please, I know some of you generally went to hell, but we've been down all the avenues you suggest. When we say we need to distance ourselves from our abusers, and that includes the church and laity, we have reached the point where we know that our mental, spiritual, and physical health is in peril. When we are so wounded and sick that we just want it all to end, and the only place we should be able to turn to receive the medicine we need is the one place that puts us in the most danger. Let us walk away in peace. Support that walk. We don't need special prayers. We don't need pity. We definitely don't need to be told we're going to hell. We just need you to say, I may not understand, but I support you, and I love you, and I will pray for you. Let us speak, and let us be. Oh, jeez. Mm. Dang. Yeah. And I've already read it. Man, I don't want to be a blubbering idiot. No, but that's I mean, so much of what mm -hmm. they say there is what I have been trying to say. Yeah. It's just like, physically, mentally, it's, it's been torturous to stay in the church. It's, it's really been tough. Super and, tough. And I, I've seen you, I don't follow him on Facebook or Twitter, but I've seen you post stuff on Father John Hollowell. And, you know, you see the scars from his brain surgery all over his young face. And as you know, he offered this up for the victims of priest-child scandal abuse things. And, and even survivors who have left the church love him. Is that right? Yep. 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 And because see, he, he walks the walk. Yeah. And this is why I was saying actions speak louder than words. The, the reason that person writes you, the reason why people who've left the church love him is they understand he's carrying in his body, if that was really his offering for that, which I believe it was, um, for what they're carrying in their hearts. The scars that we see on his head is the scars you just read on that person's heart. I, I don't, and, and you too, Father. I think you've had your own difficulties that I don't think you, that you didn't express here, but I know about. Yeah, being I offered, persecuted, I offered, being persecuted by the church. I offered all, all mine up for um, those who were trafficked and within, well, yeah, within two weeks of making that offering, everything in my priesthood fell apart, but um, but Father John Hollowell has offered it for people like you. I offered it for those who are trafficked. Um, so, you know, a letter like that is, again, something that you can understand that I can't. But, and I know I said this at the beginning, I really do mean this. On the behalf of all priests, I'm sorry to that person too. Yeah. for what that person has. And I through. can't tell them to come back to the church and, and people would, because I would say, well, I think they have at least after, and I've been going through this for 35 years, at least now they have found a, a place of peace. Um, I, you know, I don't want to speak about any, anybody in an, in an individual yeah. like, case, but, and I don't want to, I, I, I can't read their mind, but I think they were trying to comfort me because I've been struggling with wanting to leave the church. Yeah. And I've been, and I've been struggling with people who really don't have any response rather than you're going to hell right. or, or you're right. doing the wrong thing or the, yeah. the it, you know, a lot of times it sounds like a cult. 
the way the way Catholics respond to people, you can't leave. It's, no, it's, it sounds I've, culty. I've, I've been um, sidelined by a lot of people who I thought were friends on the topic of obedience of, you know, I had five parishes in five years, my first five years for defending the Eucharist, for not allowing Eucharistic ministers to do whatever. And then wh what is, what are they going to say about me that I was too vigilant on the Eucharist? No, they're going to say I'm disobedient. So I had good friends, people who are my students at different universities lead me because they were told Father Dave Nix is disobedient. So if you were just obedient, you'd still have a parish, right? There's no explaining to those people the wounds of why I have to put divine law on defending the Eucharist ahead of particular law on pleasing pastors and pastors and places on these things. Anyway, this isn't about my wounds, but the point is I've also heard really superficial answers for very deep wounds in my life too. And I just realized um, those people can't get it. Those, those people who haven't been through that can't get it. Um, just as I can't fully plumb the depths of the abysses of the pain in that letter that you just read, but you can. And if that person's listening, we'd love to have you back. I don't have anything less shallow, any deep, anything deeper to say. Than but what that. do we have to offer? This is going to sound like what everybody says, but I'm going to say it. The sacraments. I know the Orthodox have them too. But like, again, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph going to the but temple. But Father, is the price of receiving the sacraments being complicit? I don't think it is. I, again, think Jesus, it, I think it is. So Jesus, Mary, and, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph going into the temple that was run by goons is not complete because they're all sinless. Um, Mary is the Immaculate Conception. Jesus is the Son of God. And there's a private revelation, I believe, in that says Joseph was cleansed of original sin seconds after his conception. So it's unanimous among the, the saints of the church. He never committed a mortal sin, and the saints all are even clear. He never even committed. No, I'm not. Sin. I'm not. I, 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 no, I know. I, I, I know kept you're not you too long. Joseph. I'm not Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Yeah. I can't. I can't do what they. I can't do what they did. I. I can't. I can't. I guess. I guess they could deal with it. They. They could. They could. Um, um, you know, they could fulfill their Jewish obligations and go back to Nazareth and live their life. I don't, I don't know if I can do that. It's, it's become almost difficult for me to go to Sunday mass. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear the name of Pope Francis. I understand. But you give me hope as a brother in arms on this whole thing. So, you know, if one soldier goes down, it weakens the soldier, the legs of another soldier. So I, I need you in the fight. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can, can we end on something that you said? Sure. Okay. This is in that same sermon, and I'm going to post that in the description. Oh, I was cool. Post, Thanks. I was posting in the description. You wrote, Mary is taking a spiritual sledgehammer to a facade that is now collapsing. Did you hear that, Father? Yeah, I remember that. I, I remember where I gave it in Kentucky at the time. It was in a Kentucky parish outside Cincinnati. Yeah, now I remember. And you're looking for me to say, like, take it back because it doesn't appear she is. I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to double down and say that she is because I'll tell you what, what one thing changed that weekend. So I came from two worlds. I'm like in the Noah's Ordo. I'm the first focus missionary ordained who all thought I was crazy and disobedient and everything. That weekend changed that. When Vigano came out, more people started to say, wait a minute, maybe the whistles that Father Dave Nix blew weren't false. Maybe his... X, Y, and Z, concern of the Eucharist, this stuff wasn't false. More people join me. Um, then as we see uh, 2020 ramp up with the masks and all this stuff, now I have evangelicals and, and other people following me on Twitter and Facebook. Now I have young families instead of just older, and I love the older traditional women who follow me too, but that's mostly two, three years ago who followed me on Facebook and Twitter. Now there's young families who once were, call, once were told I was crazy and disobedient who are following me now. And so there's a great line in Mark's gospel about the seed that's planted that is the kingdom. And it says, and he knows not how. And see, when you and I are looking out for the change in the Vatican, the change in the hierarchies, the change in the tribunals, the change in the chanceries, we have to calm down and look around us and see that Mary is taking the spiritual sledgehammer, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be an immediate temporal fall for our, your and my enemies. Part of what that is, is many people who are on the fence waking up to the things that you and I have been saying for years, 
that's part of the spiritual sledgehammer that's happening in people's hearts. The people are starting to believe the people who from an hour and a half ago really believe Jesus rose from the dead, that we're in it for souls. You and I are in this for souls, not for the hierarchy. And that is why I still think this facade is, is falling. I talked to your friend and my friend today on the phone, Jesse Romero, and I said, a uh, woman said to me this week, it seems like the whole facade is falling and everyone's seeing the veil is falling. And he agreed with me. So I, I stick with that, Joseph, because it's not happening at the level of justice and jurisdiction at the level you and I want to see, but it is happening at the grassroots level. And honestly, that's what you and I are in it for anyway. But, and I wanted to end with that, Father, because I think it's hopeful. It gives hope to me. Is it, and you said, you said facade. Do you yeah. think what a lot of people still pretend or recognize as the church is a facade? Oh, I think 2020 with the mass and the coronavirus, the fact that we've given more advance to a virus or semi-fake virus ahead of the Son of God has really shook a lot of Nova Soto Catholics to finally say, what are we giving our money to? What is going on? This, you know, I don't know if you saw the study from out there in Stanford and UCLA, one out of 19 million people are now dying of coronavirus and we're still on lockdown. Yeah, I mean, it's too bad it took a communist takeover for people to see who's in bed with who on all of this stuff. Um, but it's a lot of people who, like I said at the beginning of the show, are secretly haunting my blog and yours that are finally starting to see, wait a minute, these guys have been saying this is a facade on this front, but they still believe in the articulated faith, morals, and traditional liturgy of the church. Let's give it a shot. And, and I can't tell you, again, this isn't to blow up your ego, how many people stay in the church or, or well, let me put it this way, how many people in the church are inspired by you? And I think there's a ton of people outside the church who are inspired by, by you too. So the facade that's falling um, is happening silently. It's not happening how you and I want. We want to see news on the New York Times of changes in the Vatican. Not going to happen right now. It's just like how the early Christian empire grew very silently through love, through sacrifice, through charity, through kindness, um, through sacrifice. And uh, it took 300 years for us to get Constantine to even make it legal. That seems way too long to me. I mean, if I were God's advisor, I'd be like, hey, isn't one martyr enough? It took a long time. Uh, but, but saints were made in the time of that. And there's people reading your blog and your books and stuff who are leaving wicked lifestyles because you're their inspiration. And that's all that matters to me at this point, because one of the things I finally resigned myself to, I'm not going to reform the church. That's why my new, my new YouTube series, I don't mean this to plug this, so I'm not even going to say where it is. My YouTube series is to teach because I realize I can only hammer away at church reform for so long. Yeah. I need to cheat. I'm, I'm teaching now because I'm not going to get bishops and other priests to listen to me, but there are families who are learning how to pray from my series, you know, and there's people out there who are living wonky lifestyles who, who look at you and they see, okay, here's a guy who's still in pain, but he's, he's a man on the way to redemption. And I want that. In fact, your transparency on your pain is ironically a major facet of your evangelization. If you had just said, I used to be a gay prostitute living in the castor doing porn making porn movies, and now I'm a happy Christian and everything's fine. And isn't the Catholic Church wonderful at the, from the top down in the hierarchy? You kind of wouldn't be approachable, you know, but um, your pain and your glory makes you approachable. And that's why we need you to say it. So stay in the church, Joseph. Thank you. You too, Father. The, the priests that have helped me the most have not been the priests who are enshrined in big cathedrals or, or, or particularly famous, they've just been priests that are just doing the drudge work like you. And I think yeah. that was Father Altman. I mean, I don't think he chose to be well known. That's right. Before, he didn't. No, but before that, he was just doing the work that priests need to do, just speaking the truth. And, and those are the priests that have always been, uh, I have to say without them, I wouldn't, I would have left a long time ago mm. if I had, if I hadn't. 
So thanks be to God for priests like that. And you know, my, my courage tank was running on empty till I watched some father Altman <laughs> videos last, last week also. He's been, he's been a godsend, but it was, but it was also then difficult to see how they went like this. Oh him. yeah, I know. But, but see, this is part of the facade falling. There's, there's a bunch of people who don't even go to the Latin mass who took his side, who said, wait a minute, why is he getting corrected for standing against abortion? Again, it's not enough to go to a yearly pro-life dinner. How is it a bad tone to call out people who vote for candidates who want to, you know, you know, you know Kamala Harris, we won't make this thing political, but you're from Northern California. I mean, Father Altman just saying basic truths. I put on Twitter, if a priest in the 1940s said you can't vote for the Holocaust party and still be Catholic, history would judge him well. Yeah. The German bishops and the German people at the time might not, you know? So this has sort of been a struggle of all of time that the church reformers at the crest of the wave, at the tip of the spear, whatever analogy you wanna use, people like you and Father Altman at the tip of the spear are not gonna get the support of the hierarchy. Because if you look at church history, it's usually the bishops who are behind the eight ball, behind the crest of the wave of the church reformers in times in history. Now, granted, these are crazy times that almost seem like that first century temple that is pretty much unprecedented, no, absolutely unprecedented in church history. But anyway, I've talked enough. Point is, people like Father Altman are, are, um, are waking people up to which team they want to be on. And there's a lot of people who weren't on the right guy's team two years ago who joined the right guy's team because of people like Father Altman. I agree. And there's, he's, he's been, he's been a, a source of comfort to me. Cause this, and I'm going to wrap this up. I mean, there's been two specific things that really gagged, that really tested my gag reflex mm -hmm. is that when they promoted uh, Archbishop Gregory to Washington, DC, cause this is a man besides his advocacy for everything LGBT. Yes. He's the one that, that sat there, you know, grinning during that whole Dallas charter. You know, people forget he I was, didn't know that. I didn't he know was that. the president of the USCCB oh. during that whole awful time. Okay. And then, and then he promoted to Washington, D.C. And then there was this hammer that dropped on poor Father Altman when he, I didn't see anything really controversial that he was saying. But, no, then, you ha but then you have priests running around telling minor children that they're gay. Yep. And they don't know anything about that person's background. Do they know that they were sexually abused? Do they know that a priest might have sexually abused them? They don't know. Who, who, they have no business doing that. And the people who've taken Father Altman's back against corrections that have come against him are realizing this facade is falling also. Yeah, God willing. God willing. So I pray that Mary takes a sledgehammer, <laughs> yep. as you said, to the facade that is now collapsing um father i've kept you too long could you give me and everybody else a blessing i don't want to i don't want to tell you who to pray for or what to do but could we also pray mm -hmm. for um those who have left the, the church and yes. I, I i don't know i i i i don't i can't particularly pray for them to come back i i don't know i I, I'll pray for them to come but back. You, but yeah. you, you, do, you do what you feel like the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. So. Okay. I'll give you a blessing. This is from Ephesians chapter 3. Okay. We bow our knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Hey, God, God bless you, Father. God bless you. Thanks for having me.